We are privileged to have Tom Watson here this morning to speak and open God's Word for us. Tom has done many things in his adult life. He was a teacher and a coach. After that, he was an airline pilot. He was a pastor for around 15 years. Over the last 15 years, though, he is the founder and the director of Bend and Knee International, a missions agency which focuses on sharing the gospel, planning churches, encouraging, strengthening churches on the, on the Navajo Nation, out west a little bit, and in Siberia. That's what he's doing. He currently lives in Texas, um, in the Dallas area, although I was told Dallas and Fort Worth, for me, they're the same. But those who live there, it's not Dallas, it's Fort Worth area. He lives there with his wife of 51 years, Bonnie, who is with him this morning. So if you have a chance to say hi to Bonnie or Tom after the service, feel free to do that. They have two children, two adult children, a son and a daughter, um, and ten grandchildren. Yesterday, uh, many of us men were encouraged and challenged at men's breakfast. We heard his testimony in a very challenging, very encouraging message to be lights for Christ where we are, to share the gospel. I do appreciate Tom's passion and his faithfulness to the Lord, to his word, and his desire to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I did ask him a few minutes ago if he wanted, if he wanted me to say anything about him. He said, I'm fine just saying. I'm a sinner saved by grace, as we all are. Would you join with me in welcoming Tom Watson? Well, good morning. Certainly a joy for Bonnie and I to be with you this morning. You have your Bibles, you can open them to John chapter 8. That's where I'm going this morning. I want to say a few things before we do that. Uh, Certainly a joy for us to be here in Lincoln, Nebraska. We were raised in northeast Kansas, so this is pretty close to home. And I want to say you're blessed to live here in Lincoln. We live in that Dallas, Fort Worth metroplex, a sprawling community of now six million people. And, uh, you know, it's good to be in Lincoln, not just because of the population, but because of the green grass and all the trees, and you can just drive a few miles out of town, you're surrounded by fields of beans and fields of corn, and uh, to me, that's a blessing. And uh, you can be thankful that you're here. I want to thank uh, Dwayne for the introduction this morning. Uh, Pastor Gill for uh, allowing me to come and fill the pulpit for him this morning, and especially for Jeff Horn, who did all the work to get us here and arranged everything and uh, did a great job with that. Um, You know, yesterday I kind of felt like I was back in Russia, because in Russia, every home you go to, they say, come on in, we have Russian tea. Well, Russian tea actually isn't Russian tea. Russian tea is a full meal. So by the time you go to three houses, one at 10, one at noon, and one at two, boy, you've had it, you know? And that's kind of the way I felt yesterday. We had food and had food and more food, but the hospitality of this church is great, and uh, we give thanks to the Lord for that. Uh, as the president of Bended Knee, I certainly want to uh, thank uh, Indian Hills for the support over the years. I uh, especially want to thank Girls of Grace uh, Stan and Nancy Butterfield in the past, and Steve and Gail DeReese now leading that. And also those who uh, are in charge of uh, Vacation Bible School. Because basically the bottom line of Benedict International is we just want to tell people about Christ. And so we want to provide the opportunity for us to do that. And we also want to provide information for them to know about Christ in Bibles. And without the support of people like you, we just couldn't do it. And we never have solicited money. We never have gone after that. But God in His grace has provided, and He's used you to be a part of that. And we give thanks to the Lord for that. And, uh, you know, just this month, in July, July 4th, we were at the Navajo Nation, Winter Rock, the capital of the Navajo Nation. We were at the July 4th, a four-day event, celebration of rodeo in uh, uh, fair. And rodeo is the number one sport among the Navajos. And they come by the hundreds. And uh, we had the privilege, we set up a booth, we had the privilege to give away 550 Bibles in those four days. And uh, we're going in October, the Lord willing, back to the Navajo Nation. On the other side, Tuba City, the Western Navajo Fair, and hopefully do the same. And we don't go back to the same place every year. In fact, as Bended Knee, we've never been to either one of these fairs that we're going to this year. 
And next year, we already got planned to go to the Apache Nation, uh, White River Apache Fair. And uh, we haven't been there since 2007, so we kind of spread that out. And we haven't been back to Russia for a while because everything we did in Russia is against the law. Everything. In fact, it's against the law to share the gospel in Russia today. It's against the law to have a home Bible study in Russia today. It's against the law to have a home church, and we got a couple of them uh, today. And, uh, but we still support them. We still have contact with them. We still uh, send funding over there for uh, pastors, for the churches, for children's ministry. And uh, again, people like you make it possible for us to do that. So we're very thankful for that. Well, let's draw our attention today to the Word of God. That's the reason why I'm here. And uh, John chapter 8, I'd like to begin reading in verse 31 and read down to verse 45, which be our text for this morning. So verse 31 of John chapter 8, Jesus therefore was saying to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's offspring. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you shall become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen from my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth, and I come forth from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of the father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar, and the father lies." But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. And we'll stop right there, even though the narrative actually goes to the end of the chapter. Now, recently I was reading the Wall Street Journal, a series of articles, and the top of the article was the title, and it was a question, it was just a simple question, what is truth? Now, that was from a political point of view, and I have to admit, that's kind of hard to figure out what is truth when it comes to politics, even right here in the United States of America, even if you watch what went on this week in Washington, D.C. What is truth? But you know, it's an age-old question. When they arrested Jesus and brought him before Pilate, Pilate asked the same question, what is truth? And you know what? Jesus didn't answer him. He didn't answer him. But you know what? He'd already given the answer. He'd already given the answer. In John 14, 6, that oh so familiar verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then in John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And so we know what the truth is. It's found in a person, only one person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's found right here in this book, the Word of God. Thy word is truth. Now, you know, it's been said in recent years that uh, when it comes to the church overall, it comes to the church overall, when it comes to truth, biblical truth, biblical knowledge, biblical theology, biblical doctrine, that the church is an inch deep and a mile wide. Very shallow overall when it comes to biblical knowledge. And biblical truth. Now, there could be many reasons for that, right? Many reasons. But I think one of the reasons is this, that one of the fastest growing movements in so-called Christendom are those who say they love Jesus but don't want to be a part of the church. They don't want to be a part of the church. They're leaving the church. 
They apparently love the groom, but they don't love the bride. And so they are leaving. In fact, Gallup said in just April this year, church attendance has dropped 20% in the last 20 years. Now, we have friends. <laughs> we have friends that we know forever. I mean, it seems like 30 years at least. Always involved in church. Always been in church and recently told us we no longer go to church. We no longer go to church. I don't understand that myself. Uh, I don't have to be a pastor or missionary to be in church on Sunday, I'll tell you that. No. You see, why did God give the church? What is God's purpose for the church? We find that in Ephesians 4, and it's very clear. To what? To teach you the truth. To equip you in the truth. To bring you to spiritual maturity in the truth. That's the purpose of the church. That's why you and I need the church. We need the church. And you know, you have a Bible. Jesus says, thy word is truth. You have the truth. You have the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, that's a resident truth teacher. He'll teach you all truth. You can go out there on your own and just live independently as much as you want to, like many are. But you cannot get around. Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, as you see the day drawing near. No, we need each other. We need to be taught the truth. We need to be equipped with the truth. We need to be brought to maturity in the truth, and that's why we have Indian Hills Community Church. That's why we're here. You know, Gallup said that one out of four Americans who claim to be religious are not part of the local church. Now, I think there's still a lot of good things going on in Christianity, a lot of good things going on in the churches today. And uh, I think there are a lot of good things going on right here. You know, yesterday at the breakfast, Adam got up and shared about the plan of evangelism, plan to knock on every door in Lincoln. You know, that's a, that's a reason enough for, for me to move to Lincoln. You know that? I'd like to be a part of that. That's pretty exciting. Going out door to door telling people about Jesus Christ. That's good. That's real good. But allow me just to be a little bit on the negative side here for a minute, all right? Last year, 2018, Ligonier Ministries, that's a ministry that was founded by the late R.C. Sproul, it released what it called the 2018 State of Theology. And some of you may have read that. And uh, in that State of Theology, they did an extensive study of what evangelicals believe. And we we're evangelicals. Now, myself, I just soon be called a Christian or a believer, but if I have to have a label and you have to have a label, I assume it's going to be evangelical. And here's what they said. They said 52% of evangelicals agree that while everybody sins a little, most are good by nature. Now, think about that. Let me ask you a question. Does the Bible emphasize the good nature of man or the sin nature of man? Does the Bible say, oh, man, you sin a little, or does it say, oh, man, you are a slave to sin? Which is it? Which is it? They went on to say that one half of evangelicals believe that God accepts the worship of all religions. You know, you see that little bumper sticker, coexist, coexist. I got a letter from Navajo a while back saying, what does that mean? What does that mean, coexist? Yeah, let's all get together no matter what we believe. No matter what. You know, it's what I call the George W. Bush theology. Because right after 9-11, on Nightline, he was interviewed, and they asked him, do Christians, do you believe that Christians pray to the same God as Muslims? And he gave that politically correct answer, I do. I do. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That narrows it down a little, Right? Narrows it down a little. We're sitting in a restaurant in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the end of May, coming back from the reservation. The guy sitting at the table next to us with his back to us. We read it right off the back, right off his back, right off the shirt. There is salvation in no other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Narrows it down, right? Jesus said, you know, enter by the narrow gate. The gate is wide. And the path is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter, enter into it. The way is narrow, the way is small, the way is narrow leads to life, and few 
are those who find it. They went on to say this, that 78% believe in the Trinity, but believe that Jesus is a created being. They don't see Jesus as he speaks in verse 58 in John chapter 8. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's the I am, I am. He is the self-existent, eternal God. That's the Jesus of the Bible. You know, John begins this by saying what? First verse of the the gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, when you look upon Jesus, you're looking upon God, the eternal God. Very God of very God. The only one who can save you from your sin. The only one who can release you from the bondage of sin. The only one who can give you eternal life. Because why? He is eternal life. He is the eternal Son of God. Not a created being. That's Jesus Christ, our Savior. So why did God give the church? Well, we go back to Ephesians 4. So you might be taught the truth. So you might be equipped in the truth, so that you might come to spiritual maturity in the truth. And we read a little further, we get to verse 14 of Ephesians 4. So we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Because, unfortunately, that apparently describes too much of evangelical Christianity today. In our younger generation, I just don't know what we're doing there. You know, I think you're doing a lot of good things here, but overall, I don't know what we're doing. You know, it's said that of the younger generation, you have the lowest number of professing Christians of any generation over the last 200 years. That's pretty sad. Now, I preach in Navajo churches. I look out there. I don't even see a kid. I don't see a teenager. And I say to them, well, what happens when you die? Church dies with you? Where are these kids? And they say that teenagers who are raised in Christian homes, that are raised in the church, over half of them depart the church by the time they're 30. Many of them right out of college by the time they're 23. They're literally gone. You know, I'm a grandfather. I'm a father. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. You know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I observe young people today, kids that are raised in Christian homes, people, kids that are raised in the church, and I see them... Gradually moving away into a world that knows not Jesus Christ. I don't understand that. There can't be said of them in the end, if you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine because they're not going to be there. It amazes me. These, these kids, Christian kids, Christian homes, churches, you know, they, they know so much. They, they can probably quote to you the lyrics of practically every song that came out in the last 10 years. They can quote that old theologian of old, verbatim, Barney Fife. Yeah. Yeah, now if they want to know something, they don't ask mom and dad or a Sunday school teacher, they ask Alexa. Yeah. Alexa. That's who they ask. They have great knowledge. Spend hours on the phone, hours on the internet, hours on the computer. But ask him to quote you the Ten Commandments. Ask him to share with you the Beatitudes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ask him, can you tell me these simple little things called the five fundamentals of the faith and they don't even know what you're talking about? They don't know. They don't know about the inerrancy of the Bible, that this Bible is totally trustworthy for them, for all their life. They don't know about the deity of Christ, that Christ is truly God, sufficient for every need they're going to face in life. They don't know about the virgin birth, the importance of it. 
that Christ had to be sinless. They don't know the importance of the substitutionary atonement, that only Christ could die for their sin. They don't know about the reason for the resurrection, the absolute purpose of the resurrection, that Christ defeated death and sin and the devil, and that he's coming back again. They can't tell you about that. They can't tell you about that. You see, in John 17, 17, we read this. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. What does sanctify mean? It means set apart. Set apart. This truth, the truth of the word of God is a set apart. Young people, parents, and everybody else. Just set them apart. Set them apart from what? How did all that happen? Well, back in the 1900s, early 1900s, the church began to go liberal. You had churches and denominations and pastors and theologians who no longer upheld the inherency of Scripture, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the substitutionary atonement, the resurrection and second coming. And so in 1895, they came up with five little things to separate us, to sanctify us, right straight out of the Bible, called the fundamentals of the faith. And uh, fundamentalism got a bad name, we know that. So out of that, we became evangelicals. We're evangelicals. But let me say this. Every true fundamentalist, every true evangelical, every true Arminian, every true Calvinist, every true Biblicist, every true Christian believes and holds to the five fundamentals of the faith or they're not true to who they claim to be doesn't really matter what the title is. What do you really believe about the Word of God, the truth of Scripture? And see, they still set us apart today. They still set us apart today. Those little fundamentals of the faith, those little five truths that are coming right out of the Bible, set us apart from liberalism yet today, over 100 years later, from the progressive church, and also from this ecumenical, watered-down, ear-tickling Christianity. They set you apart from the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, and the Roman Catholic Church. They set you apart from the cultic, idolatrous, false religions of the world. They set you apart from the extremes of the charismatic movement, the health and wealth gospel, and the idea this is your best life now. They set you apart from the current fad, Zen Buddhism, mindfulness, contemplative prayer. And they set you apart from self-sufficiency, age of self, and political correctness. Still serve a godly purpose. Still there. And you might ask, and you said all this, (laughs) what does this have to do with our text? And I think it has everything to do with our text. Because, see, we are facing nothing new under the sun. We are facing the same problem Jesus faced. Or maybe I should say Jesus faced the same problem that we're facing. People who say they're Christians, people who say they're believers, but by what they say or what they deny or what they reject, they quickly prove that they are not. Quickly prove that. And here... J.C. Rawls says this, and I think he nails it on the head. There were many, it seems, at this particular period who professed to believe in our Lord Jesus and expressed a desire to become like his, become his disciples, yet there is nothing to show they had true faith. You know how sad it is when a Christian lives like everybody else, like everybody else. Rob goes on to say, to the extent in which we may be intellectually convinced of the truth and know our duty, while our hearts are not renewed and continue in sin, is one of the most painful phenomena in history of human nature. Let us never be content with believing things to be true without a personal laying hold of a living person, Jesus Christ, and actually following him. Because if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. But... You know, look what it says in the Bible. Had believed in him. Now, how do we get around that? Had believed in him. That's what the Bible says. They had believed in him. But they quickly prove otherwise, right? 
In verse 33 and verse 39, they reject the substitutionary atonement. Oh, we're Abraham's children. We don't need you, Jesus. We don't need you, Jesus. You know, I, I was teaching a Sunday school class in a liberal church one day, and I, I, on that Sunday I went around and I asked these people, tell me when you became a Christian. And they all said, well, we've always been Christians, one right after another. We were raised in a Christian home. We've always been Christians. Well, no need for Jesus, I guess. No need for Jesus. In verse 37, they reject the inerrant word of God. In verse 41, they imply that he was born in fornication, rejecting the virgin birth. In verses 58 and 59, they're rejecting the deity of Christ. And then they get verbally abusive. You know? In verse 41, they refer to him as an illegitimate child. Verse 48, they call him a Samaritan and a, as a demon. In other words, a half-breed who is demonic, demon-possessed. And then in verse 59, they get physically abusive. They pick up stones, and they're going to stone him. Yet, verse 31 says, what had believed in him. How do you get around that? Well, Greek scholars will tell you this, and you don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure this out, all right? They will tell you this, that the finite, finite verb believed in verse 31, followed by the him, does not always indicate a change of heart which the rest of the chapter proves. In other words, you don't have to be a scholar to figure that out. Just read the chapter. They say they believe, but the rest of the chapter proves they didn't believe. Now, they believe something. They apparently liked uh, the miracles they were watching or getting fed or whatever, but their heart wasn't changed. Their heart wasn't changed. And, and John described this twice in his gospel beside right here in John 2 23 says now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast many believed in his name beholding his signs which he was doing in other words they were impressed by his miracles but Jesus on his part was not entrusted himself to them for he knew all men he knew their heart wouldn't change he knew their heart wouldn't change in John chapter 12 verse 43 nevertheless many even the rulers believed in him but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing to him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. What does Romans 10, 9 says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. Yet they believed. They believed something, but their heart was not changed. So, Jesus said to them, You shall know the truth, and truth shall make you free. Only Christ can make you free. But notice what they did. They go into a complete denial. Complete denial. Verse 33, they answered him, We're Abraham's offspring. We've never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you shall become free? Complete denial. Did they forget the 400 years they were slaves in Egypt? Did they forget that? Did they forget that when they came out, they were in bondage to the Philistines for a while? And six centuries later, they were in bondage to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and then the Syrians. And now they're in bondage to the Romans. In fact, many of the Jews at that, right, right at that particular time were slaves. Roman slaves. You know, back in the 90s, Bonnie and I went to Israel. On our way, we stopped at Athens. We rented a car. We drove over to Old Corneth. And... Uh, there you find the ruins of the Temple of Apollo up on the hill, the Temple of Aphrodite, the Bema Seat. But to get there, of course, it was on a peninsula that sticks out from the mainland. So to get there, you had to drive across a canal, just like the Panama Canal. So you don't have to go all the way around the Horn of South America. Here they dug a canal, so you don't have to go around this peninsula where Corinth is located to get through that part of the Mediterranean Sea. And who built the canal? It was built in Roman times. But who built it? Jewish slaves. Jewish slaves. So they're in denial, but you know what the biggest denial is? They're in denial of their sin. They're in denial of their sin. They don't see their sin. They don't see the bondage of sin. They don't see the power in bondage of sin. That they're in. 
And what was their thinking? Well, Paul put it pretty well in Galatians 2.15. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. That's the way they looked at life. Oh, we're not sinners. Those old Gentiles over there, they're the sinners, not us. But notice what the Lord says. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Every one. Not just Gentiles, but Jews. Everyone. Everyone. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means all. Everyone means everyone. There is no exception. There's no exception. All are sinners, enslaved to sin, who need a Savior. Who need a Savior. Everyone. You're not saved because you're Abraham's offspring. You're not saved because you're raised in a Christian home or even in a Christian church. You're only saved by Jesus. By Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. That's it. I remember... In, when I was going to seminary, I wanted to keep my heart and mind into uh, evangelism, so I go out and knock on doors like your church is going to do or is doing. And um, I'd knock on 40 doors a day, and uh, I just wanted to tell people about Jesus. I remember knocking and saying, things are different now. People won't even come to the door now, so it's going to be a task for you all. But you can do it, and God will give you some people to talk with, and God will give you some people to bring to this church and lead to the Lord. So do it. But uh, you know, this lady came to the door, a young mother, and uh, I introduced myself and began to talk to her and told her why I was here. I wanted to tell her about Jesus and how we're all sinners and need Jesus as our Savior. And she stopped me right there and said, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Yeah, that's what the Jews were doing. We're not sinners. I had lunch with a guy who heads up a large radio network out of Dallas. And uh, I was having lunch with him, and he's into what was called covenant theology. And he said that his two grown children have never made a profession of faith, never been a part of the church, totally rejected Christianity, but because I'm elect, they're elect, and therefore they're saved. And boy, am I scratching my head. And I said, well, you make a good Jew. You make a good Jew. But you're not really looking at the truth of Scripture. The truth of Scripture. So, verse 35. Slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. Well, you know, a Jew isn't a forever, or a slave isn't a forever thing. That's, that's the Lord's point here. You know, they could be sold, they could be dismissed, they could be released, and in time they're going to die. But he says the son, the son does remain forever. And what does that mean? It means when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're in a permanent relationship with Christ. John 10, no one shall snatch you out of his hand. No one. You're in a very permanent relationship with Christ. To be a follower of Christ, verse 31, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You know, it's a permanent thing. It's not Hosanna, Hosanna one week and crucify him, crucify him the next week, which we read in this text. It's a permanent relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Forever means forever. And so verse 36, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If, you know what he's doing when he says if, same thing in verse 31, if you abide. He's putting the responsibility on them. He's putting the responsibility on them. You know, the Lord's willing to set them free, but they have to be willing. They have to be willing. You know, uh, th these people were not in any way willing. They were not willing. They didn't want anything to do with him, really. So if puts a responsibility on them. Christ came actually to set them free. He came to set the captives free. He came to set us free from what? The slavery and bondage of sin. Are you willing to put your faith and your trust in him? And so they were not willing. 
You know, and a sad thing about that is that you, you could take a whole tablet and start writing down what God would do for a sinner, and you run out of space. I mean, you can't hardly put any limitation on what God will do for a sinner. John 3, 16, why did God send his only beloved son? For a sinner. For a sinner. Yeah. At the right time, Christ died for who? The ungodly, sinners. He who spared not his own son, but delivered and loved for us all. How shall he not freely with him give us all things? Who's he talking about? Sinners. Sinners. But you know, there's one thing God's not going to do. He's not going to believe for you. You're not going to believe. He'll tug at your heart. He'll draw you. He'll convict you. He'll do everything else because he wants you saved. But he's not going to believe for you if, if places responsibility on the person. If. And then he says, you shall be free indeed. That means fully free, totally free, only freedom one needs. Only freedom one needs. No, on July 4th, we're on the reservation among the Navajo people. Navajo people are very patriotic people. Very patriotic people. In fact, one of the first pastors I got to know, and doing for years, now he's home with the Lord. We went to his funeral, Monty and I, way out in the middle of the reservation. And a uh, little old church, no restroom. I asked where the restroom at. They said, well, go over the hill, you know. And... Uh, Lemuel Yazzie, a Navajo code talker, a World War II Navajo code talker, loved the Lord, served the Lord all his life, but boy did he love this thing called the United States of America. So patriotic. And we have so many freedoms, freedoms. Constitution gives us a lot of freedoms, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Now, from a Christian perspective, I believe that's waning. I believe that's waning. Maybe you better get all those doors knocked this year. It's waning. You're a Nebraskan. Surely, surely you appreciate the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, protect your family, go out and shoot a coyote or something. Surely you like that, right? And this is why I don't begin to understand why America would even begin to move toward socialism. I don't understand that. Let, let me ask you, you you're, you're a Nebraskan, let me ask you, what country can you name, what nation can you name that has, that is a socialist country that has a second amendment? And you can't name one. You can't name one. You know, go to Russia. There you want to find out about socialism. Right now, you know, you can't even share the gospel lawfully. You can't have a home church. You can't have a Bible study lawfully. You have to register now your email. You have to register your telephone. And if you talk to a foreigner or get a letter from a foreigner, have some contact with a foreigner, especially American, they're going to drag you in. And want to know what that's all about. Is that what we want in America? Is that what we want in America? That type of thing? You know, we send money over there, and I always have to send it by Western Union, then I have to send a text saying, here, here, I'm sending this to a certain individual or a certain church, and here's the number where they can go to Western Union and pick it up. And the last time I did that, I never got a response. I normally get a response right away, so I kept sending it and kept sending it. And finally, I got a response, just a little note by text. I'm being checked by security. My contact was being checked by security. Yeah, they were checking her emails, they were checking her texts, they wouldn't know what you're doing in contact with an American, with a foreigner. Is that what we want? You know, you might say I'm getting a little political here, right? Well, I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. Because socialism, and I don't think people understand socialism, socialism comes out of the minds of people like Karl Marx, which you can find his giant statue in the middle of Moscow. Or Latimer Lenin, whose statue is right there too. And it's totally incompatible with the Word, incompatible with the Word of God. Totally. Totally. So you can call my little political clique 
here political, but maybe it's not. But, you know, you have to keep it in perspective. And I think J.C. Raw again puts it in the right perspective. He says, he says this, Let us not forget in these days that the only liberty which is truly valuable in God's sight is that which Christ gives. All political liberty, however useful for many purposes, is worthless unless we are children of God, heirs of the kingdom, by faith in Jesus Christ. He is, the only, he is only perfectly free who is free from sin. Yeah. We really don't have to have the Second Amendment. We really don't have to have freedom of speech. It's great that we have it, but we have to have freedom from sin. We have to have freedom from sin. So, verse 37, I know you're there, Abraham's, and I probably need to move on here. Uh, I know that you are Abraham's uh, offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Totally rejection of God's word. Totally rejection. You know, if you're going to know the truth and truth is going to set you free, the first thing you have to do is be open to it. You have to be open to it. I remember the first two people I witnessed to, three days after I became a Christian, I drove home to tell them about Jesus. And it was like talking to a brick wall. They had no openness whatsoever to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. None whatsoever. So, he says, <clears throat> he goes on to say, I speak the things which I've seen in my father, therefore you also do the things you heard in your father. And when he talks about their father there, he's not talking about Abraham. They answered him, said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. What did Abraham do? Romans 4, Abraham simply believed. That's what he did. Abraham was open to the truth. Abraham heard the truth. Abraham believed the truth. It was reckoned unto him as righteous. That's all God's asking of you and I. That's all. So they were not open to it like a brick wall. Oh, the power and the bondage of sin. And so verse 40 but as you were seeking to kill me, a man who told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father. And again, he's not talking about Abraham. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. In other words, they were denying the virgin birth. There were stories, there was literature written at that particular time that Jesus was an illegitimate child. Joseph didn't claim to be his father, so he had to be an illegitimate child. That's basically the accusation. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth, and I have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You couldn't hear it. So if you're going to know the truth, the truth sets you free first. You've got to be open to it. They weren't. Secondly, you've got to hear it. They wouldn't hear it. When Stephen, Stephen was stoned, Acts chapter 6, he was proclaiming solid Old Testament biblical truth to them, and they covered their ears. They wouldn't hear it. They didn't want to hear it. You know, I have people tell me, well, the reason why they didn't hear it and couldn't hear it is because God and his sovereignty wouldn't let them hear it. I don't believe that. I can't find anything in this text that says God wouldn't let them hear there's three reasons why they couldn't hear. One, they weren't open to it. One, two, they just weren't open to it. Two, the power and bondage of sin that they were in. And the third reason, Jesus reveals their true father to them. Verse 44, you're your father the devil. You want to do the devil's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. No, they were listening to the wrong voice. They rejected the one who was full of grace and truth for the one who had no truth in him. They rejected the one who spoke the truth for the one who only spoke lies. They rejected the one who would give them life for the one who would destroy their life. They rejected the one and the only one who could set them free for the one who would keep them in bondage. And finally, verse 45 
because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Do you want to know the truth? The truth sets you free. You've got to be open to it. You've got to hear it. You've got to listen to it. And two, you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe. 150 times in the New Testament, it's faith, it's faith, it's faith. You must believe. You must believe. And they wouldn't believe. You know, a few years back, a guy came to me, and he was in and out of the church. I never did really know where he stood for sure. He was an intellectual. He was always coming up with these great ideas. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, there may be more than one God. There may be several gods out there. All of them having their own place, their own universe, doing their own thing. I said, that can't be true. Why not? Because the Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Lord spoke to Isaiah and said, there's no gods before me. There's no gods after me. I alone am the Savior. I am alone and God. Can't be. He said, well, that's kind of hard to prove. So I don't know how to prove it. God's perfectly pleased if I just believe it. If I just believe it. You see, I can't prove I can't prove that God spoke the world into existence out of nothing. I can't prove that God did that in a literal 24 hours, six days. But you know what? I believe it. I believe it. I don't begin to believe in evolution. I don't believe, begin to believe in theistic evolution. I believe just what the Bible says. God did it. He spoke it into existence. He did it in six days. I just believe it. I can't prove the virgin birth. Nobody can disprove it. Nobody can disprove the creation either. I can't prove it, but boy, do I believe it. Do I believe it? You know, I was visiting a family once, and uh, they visited the church. I went in, and I sat down in their living room. One of the first questions I asked them was this, do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God? And she said to me, well, we were doing all right till we got that part where that donkey was talking. He said, that did it for us. And we just couldn't believe that donkey was talking. Well, you know, I can't prove that God used a donkey, made him speak to rebuke a wayward prophet, but I believe it. That's all God asked of me. In fact, God may be making a donkey talk right now, okay? That's possible. Right now. You know... There's some things you just can't prove. You just have to believe them. But you know, there's something you can prove. You can prove this to yourself. You can prove it to your family. You can prove it to your friends, people you work around, people you go to school with, anybody who's looking on. And of course, there's always somebody looking on. You can prove this. You can prove that you know the truth and the truth has set you free. You can know that. You can know that. You know, uh, after I was saved, I was driving down the road one day, I came into town, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm facing temptation. Temptations all around, sins looking me in the eye. And boy, do I know the passing pleasures of sin. I've only been saved a while. And boy, did my old flesh want to get involved in a hurry. And I said this for the first time. I've had to say it many times since, and I should say it more often than what I've said it. I said this for the first time. I looked sin in the eye, and I said this. I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to do this anymore. Jesus has set me free. And I'm not suggesting you positive thinking or mind over matter or contemplative prayer or pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm encouraging you to live according to what God says in the Word here, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in Him, well, He set you free. He set you free. That's what He's done for you. You know, Peter said it this way, for time is past is sufficient for you to carry out the desires of the Gentiles. And he names all kinds of sins that you could be involved in. And he says, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation. You don't do that anymore. You don't have to do that. You know, a while back, I got a text from a guy. 
he had the wrong number. And he sent me a text, and he wanted me to meet him in a bar in Dallas, have a few drinks after work. Now, by the grace of God, I never got involved in that, so there wasn't any temptation there. But, uh, you know, I knew he was from Dallas because of the phone number. So I didn't respond to it. So he sent it again. And he sent it again. And he sent it again. And finally I said, well, you know, i got to answer this guy. He's getting a little frustrated here probably. He's going to drink a lot when this is over with. And so I responded. And I didn't say, Joe, I don't even remember what his name was. I didn't say, Joe, you know, you got the wrong number. You know know what I sent back? I sent back this. I won't be there. I don't do that anymore. That's what I sent back. And you know the answer that came back immediately from him? All in caps with exclamation point on the end. What? What? Yeah. You know, that's the way they ought to look at you and I. They ought to look at you and I and say, what? They don't do that anymore. What? They don't live like us. What? They're not like everybody else in the block. Why? Because you were open to the truth. You heard the truth. You responded by faith to the truth. And Jesus Christ, your great God and Savior, did exactly what he promised. He has set you free. He has set you free. And live, you Nebraskans, you people right here in Indian Hills, live for the glory of God by living as if you are free because you are free. Praise God. He has set you free. Let us bow in prayer. Father, thank you that knowing that only Jesus Christ could set us free. Now, there's time in our life where you convicted us of our sin, convicted us of our need for the Savior, and we came to the cross, and we found forgiveness. The weight and burden of our sin was gone, and the Bible came alive, and we found a freedom like we never had before, And we praise you for it. Thank you, Lord, for being our great God and Savior. Thank you for this church and the people of this church. Pray your blessing upon them, especially in their evangelism, reaching out to those who know not the Lord here in this city. I pray that you'll bless them in their daily walk with you. May they continue to come under the teaching of the Word and be equipped by the Word and mature in the Word. And just live as they really are, your people. And we praise you for that. We ask your blessing and the rest of the day. In Christ's name, amen.